Good evening, everybody. And just before we kick off, I just want to take a moment and ask you to take a moment to um, uh, familiarise yourselves with the uh, exit points here. And oh, sorry. okay. <laughs> did any? Did do I need to repeat that? No. Okay. <laughs> There you are. Um, and um, the, in the very unlikely event that you need to use an exit suddenly for any reason whatsoever, um, one of the members of staff or all the members of staff will guide you um, to a safe assembly point. So having said that, um, clutching my microphone, um, I'd like to thank you all and welcome you all to Charleston, to the Charleston Festival, and to say a very particular welcome to our speakers this evening, Mark Haddon and Claire Armitstead. Mark is an author, illustrator, and screenwriter who's written many, many books for adults and children. Um, as it's on a roll at the moment, and it has been for some time, but it's very uppermost at the moment, it's impossible not to mention the curious incident of the dog in the night time, which was awarded 17 major literary prizes and has sold in its millions since he wrote it 10 years ago. And he's just won an amazing seven Olivia Awards for the stage adaptation, which transferred from the National Theatre to the West End this spring. Um, to counterbalance that, Mark has recently been in the news for campaigning for a higher tax role to be introduced for people such as himself who can afford it. And I think in a context where... I, just, I did want to say, in, in a context that's so closely associated with Keynes, how much I feel um, he would have given his blessing for that. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just add to that that my Mark is active in many social causes, including working with prisoners um, for English Pen. Um, tonight we're going to uh, range around many subjects uh, because uh, Mike is a very um, eclectic creative writer um, and Claire will be talking to him. So Claire, who's chairing this event, is books editor for Guardian News and Media, having previously been literary editor and arts editor. She's also been a theatre critic, and I'm sure that will come in tonight, and appears regularly on the radio and TV and at the Charleston Festival as a cultural commentator. And just one more thing before we proceed, I'd like to thank Prudence and Kevin Watts for their sponsorship of this event and for their support of the festival over several years. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Mark and Claire. Well, Mark and I have actually sat on a, a podium before a few times. We and, have, yes. Um, we, so we have this habit of, it, poor, poor Diana was saying, well, what are you going to talk about? Saying, well, we'll talk about everything. She said, what do you mean everything? I said, well, you just have to look inside Mark's brain, and there is everything. <laughs> Sitting over, having supper just now, we were talking about, he suddenly said, I, I know where the faces came from in the curious incident of the dog in the night time. I stole them from Wittgenstein. <laughs> <laughs> just explain that little bit. Uh, yes. Um, I think I'm so creative and everything sort of just comes off the top of my head and then throughout my life I keep stumbling on the places where I've nicked absolutely everything from. <laughs> and if you've read Curious Incident, God, whenever I meet people these days I sort of assume they have read Curious Incident and um, then they apologise if they haven't and then say you don't have to apologise if you haven't. Um, if you have, you'll, you'll know that at the beginning of the book Christopher talks about his, his trouble recognising um, emotions on faces and there are four little circles with the sort of dots and the mouths and I thought that was that ev everyone thought of that when you thought about emotions on faces and then this sounds like appalling doesn't it as I was leafing through Wittgenstein's remarks and conversations recently off the bookshelf I, I, I opened a page and there were the four little circles with the faces he's talking about how we understand how, how we understand emotions and you know I lost another point for having a, an idea myself <laughs> So, so um, one of the things that I found interesting about the Curious Incident is that you didn't actually research autism for it. Let's go down that one just briefly. <laughs> since this Get that so one over and done let's with. Let's get that one over and done with. Um, no. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to talk about something you didn't do, isn't it? The reason I didn't do it, um, it sounds clever in retrospect. I think it was quite a wise thing to do. 
It started off with the image of the dog with the fork in it, and that struck me as quite vivid and embarrassingly rather funny, I thought. And it inevitably led to a story, because you know you knew a story had happened once you'd seen that. And then I realised that it was only funny if you described it in a very flat voice. So I described it in a flat voice, and I thought, I really like this voice. And then I thought, well, who can I give the voice to? I think if I'd sat down and decided to invent someone like Christopher, who had a certain diagnosis, if he had gone to the doctor and had a diagnosis, it would have been a disaster. What's nice is that Christopher seems to exist as a fully-fledged imaginary human being, and people can have endless arguments about what diagnosis he would get if he was real and did go to a psychologist and have a... And, and I can leave everyone to get on with that discussion themselves, because I, for me, he feels like an imaginary human being entirely separate from all those questions. Mm -hmm. In fact, when, when people ask, ask me to describe Christopher, I usually steal my own words from the book in which he describes himself when he just says, I'm a young mathematician with some behavioural difficulties. <laughs> As a friend of mine said, like a lot of mathematicians. <laughs> And you are a mathematician. No, I'm not. You, you are very good at math. No, I'm not. You? This is the other thing about... He's always described as this maths genius, right? Um, he's just quite good at maths. The problem is people who don't know anything about maths just see maths and just think, oh, shit, genius. Genius, you can understand this. Um, I did my, I did my A-level a year early, but the thing about maths is if you can do it, you can do it. You know what I mean? It's not like history or geography where you have to, you have to consume a huge numbers, a, a number of books and numbers of facts. If you can do maths, it's quite easy. And at school, I found maths quite easy, so I did my A-level a year early. And he's, just, he's like that. I mean, he's not, he's not a math genius. In fact, several of my mathematical friends were a little bit snooty when they looked at the A-level question in the back of the book. I said, well, that's not that hard, is it? <laughs> And what people, a lot of people who, of course, now it's won all these Olivier Awards, everybody thinks of it as a stage play, but it was an award-winning book originally. <laughs> it, 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 won, it won the Guardian Prize, the it Guardian did, First yeah, Book Prize, the Children's Fiction Prize was the first prize. And it was, the other thing that people forget is it was the book that started the big crossover boom, um, because it was the first book that was recently, that was simultaneously published as an ad, in an adult edition and a teenage edition. So can I personally apologise for so that? So you have to apologise. My goodness, you've caused problems, <laughs> haven't you? Okay, actually, the, the boring, nerdy thing about it, which, which also rather fascinates me, what it did, it didn't just start a sort of cultural trend, because that was already there. Publishers really wanted to, for obvious reasons, sell books to both markets, because there's more people there. What it did was it, it showed people, publishers, how to do it. Um, David Fickling published the young adult version and Jonathan Cape published an adult version and someone in Random House had this genius idea that what you had to do was just put, just put two ISBN numbers in. No one had twigged before that in the ISBN number is a little bit of code saying which bit of the bookshop does this go into? So all these publishers like Bloomsbury, for example, would do these really sexy young adult novels with a sort of brooding cover and it would go into the bookshop and it would go, ching, kid's book, and it would just go back into the kid's section. So if you, as soon as we had two editions, they both came up as different parts of the shop, so it's great. You, you got a box, you got uh, two different covers, and they went into two parts of the shop. Really boring, but in fact, it was, that was the stroke of genius. It was two with accountancy, not marketing books. But you nevertheless did get totally separate readerships, and it won an adult prize. It was the Whitbread Book it of did. the Year. Um, as well as the Guardian Children's Prize, I, of course. Well, I, I, <laughs> I had for years... Written, I've written many, many children's books. I want, always wanted to write for adults. I'd written five novels which I'd thrown away before, five adult novels before Curious. And when I wrote Curious, I, it never occurred to me that it was a, a novel for kids at all. I thought, this is an adult novel. It just happens to have a teenage protagonist. Um, and I finished it. I took along to Claire Alexander, my wonderful agent, and um, she said, uh, Mark, I think we're going to submit this to both adult publishers and kids publishers. My heart just sank. I felt like I'd been tunnelling for 12 months and I'd come up in the commandant's office. <laughs> It, it was in the end. It, what was great was being able to do this sort of deal where uh, both Jonathan Cape and David Fickling published it. Because I mean, who doesn't want the the, the broadest range of readers for their books? Mm. That's fantastic. I'm, but I'm very glad that it wasn't published just as a children's book. Mm. What was it like seeing it coming back to life now? Do you feel it's a bit of a millstone around your neck? Um, it's one of the most productive gold-plated millstones you can have, isn't it? Really. And don't you, <laughs> is it, is it, is it, is it, 
it not true that you live in what you, you call the dog house, i.e.? Dog towers, we the call dog it. The dog towers, i.e. the towers, house we call it. the dog bought for him. Yes. He was um, living in a very tiny house when I went in, in, in East Oxford when I went to interview him originally. Not anymore, I guess. It's slightly bigger now, yes. Um, the truth is this. I mean, it, it, it's hard to say it without feeling churlish, but um, if you... If you had to eat your favourite curry every night for 10 years, you'd probably get a bit tired of it. And I've had to talk about my beloved book, about that frequently for the last 10 years. And I, I really want to just ignore it for a few years because I'd lost the ability to, I'd lost the ability to take Curious Incident off the shelf and flick through it and experience it as if I was a, you know, a naive reader. And once you've lost that, something pre really precious has gone. So when it was adapted for the stage... I obviously wanted it to be a great play and I wanted it to be a success for the National Theatre and for Simon Stevens who adapted it and Marion Elliott who directed it. But secretly, from a selfish point of view, I wanted to sit in the stalls on that first night and somehow have it brought to life again for me in a different form, as if I was opening the book for the first time. And it happened. It was a really amazing experience. I felt it had been... Brought back from the dead sounds <laughs> sounds not quite right, but I felt I was I was reading it for the first time again. It's amazing. But there are some things about the stage adaptation that uh, fall short of the book. I thought I I I, I have a lot. Has everybody? How many people have seen the stage adaptation? Have quite a lot and read the book as well. One of the things that struck me was particularly if you remember the central that central um, episode when he goes into the station and he's bewildered by the, the time train timetables because he can't make perspective in his head. And it just seems to me such a brilliant illustration of what it must be like to be in the Oh, when all the text head. is jumbled when up. When all the text is jumbled yeah. up because he can't distinguish between what's important information and what isn't. You can't get that through that ad a the theatrical adaptation, can you? Because it's all no. coming from outside. Well, that's only one aspect of the, the, the main problem of an adaptation and why we balked at other people doing it for a long time, because a novel... Well, this novel is radically first-person, so you have a, a reliably unreliable narrator and everything, but everything is filtered through his slightly eccentric consciousness. But there is no first-person on stage. I mean, it's all third-person on stage. You're always seeing people from the outside, and that's why I thought it would be so hard for Simon Stevens to do it. I and mean, I think he's done it rather wonderfully. But he, right from the off, you have to admit that you cannot do the same thing when a novel is a novel. And I really hate novels that have been written to be turned into films. You, know, you can tell, you smell on the page sometime. There's not a lot of great deal of interiority to it. You can think, they can smell Hollywood at the edge of the pages. Um, but Curi Curious is very much not like that. Um, and the, one of the strangest things about it is if you've, read, if you've read the book, you will know that there's a sort of a peak in the centre. The whole story hinges upon Christopher... Actually, who's not read it? Am I spoiling anything for anyone? <laughs> I'm going to wreck it for you now. I'm sorry about this. Um, <laughs> when Christopher finds his mother's letters and finds out what has really happened, that's the moment, because that's when, that's when he realises the world is vastly different. And it was really strange to see it on stage, because everyone's point of view is given equal weight on stage, and on stage, the centre of the story is when his father reads the novel that Christopher's writing, isn't it? It's like the whole centre of gravity have shifted. Mm. But I like the fact they have not tried to be um, craven and literalistic about the book. What I'm most proud of about the stage um, version, and, and it's the reason why I can recommend it to people so wholeheartedly, <coughs> is I feel that I've contributed a small thing, which is the text they started with. And that has become the jumping off point for what is a celebration of what is great about theatre and what you can do on stage. Mm. And it becomes more and more referential to itself as a piece of theatre, doesn't it, as it, yeah. as it goes on? And it's also, what's quite nice is it's actually different, from, we were saying this earlier, from, from um, quite a lot of new plays on stage in London at the moment. I mean, London theatre is, I think, is really exciting at the moment. It's probably the most exciting bit of culture in the country at the moment. But nearly all the new plays that are being written are quite talky plays. They're about people talking to each other or shouting at each other. What's nice about this is it's, it has everything in it. it ha the, everything is vital. There's ballet in it, which is, I think is extraordinary. People come out saying, well, it was obvious using ballet in Curious Incident, wasn't it? But of course, it's not obvious. And there's, there's ballet, there's movement, there's sort of video projection, the music, the lighting, everything is really important. It's a sort of total art in a Wagnerian sense. Oh, Wagner. <laughs> right, now, and now for something completely different, because Mark has... has, isn't, has absolutely been busy since The Dog. Um, this is the second novel you've yeah. written. You've also written a, a collection of poetry yeah. and a play. 
yes. a different play. And The Red House happened to go into paperback the same week as the Olivier's, wasn't it? It did, yes. The same week. <laughs> so um, what I would like you to do is to read a bit okay. of it. Um, maybe set it up, explain. It's a country, a sort of country house nightmare, family nightmare thing, isn't yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound like a rubbish Agatha Christie. <laughs> Anyway, this sophisticated contemporary novel set in a country house. Um, it is set in a country house on the Welsh border, but partly because I always think that it's the towering inferno principle. You often don't really understand what groups of people are like until you have squeezed them into a corner, until you've sort of set light to their building or you put them in a kind of lifeboat. And it's always a question to me of how to, how to do that. It's also a question for me of how to, how to shape a book so it isn't melodramatic, because life doesn't really have beginnings and endings. It's not, most of our lives are not shaped like novels. Everything keeps rolling on, new stories stop and start. So I wanted to, I wanted to take an extended family of eight, of eight people, and I thought if I took the week out of their lives and stuck them on holiday together, I'd sort of pressurise them, and I'd give a shape to the book that wasn't, wasn't melodramatic. It's just a week taken out of their lives. So it's an extended family. It's a brother and sister who've had almost no contact except for sort of managing the stages of their, their mother's decline with Alzheimer's until her death. And when the two families get together at the funeral, um, they realise that they're, they're, they're all that's left. So uh, Angela and Dominic, with their three children, Benji, who's 12, and Alex and Daisy, who are teenagers, get together with her brother and, uh, and his new and rather glamorous wife and their rather bitchy daughter, Melissa. And he's a doctor, and he offers to take his sister and her family away on this, what turns out to be a slightly inappropriate country holiday to sort of rebuild the family. And um, as you said, things don't turn out quite as planned, as they don't on family holidays. Um, I'm going to read a... This is a description of the, of the house and the, and the environment. It's set in a, pl a place in the Black Mountains, which I know very well, near Hay on Wye. And although it's about, it's about families, it's also about the house and it's about the architecture and it's about the landscape as well. I feel very attached to that landscape there. So. Two gliders ride the freezing grey air that pours over the ridge so low you could lean a ladder against the fuselage and climb up to talk to the pilots. Spits of horizontal rain, Hay Bluff, Lord Hereford's Knob, Heather and Purple Moorgrass, and little craters of rippling peaty water. By the trig point, a red kite weaves through the holes in the wind, then glides into the valley, eyes scanning the ground for rats and rabbits. This was shallow coastal waters once, before the great plates crushed and raised it, limestone and millstone grit, the valleys gouged out by glaciers with their cargo of rubble, upper blind, furs farm, Alcon court. Roads and footpaths following the same route they did in the Middle Ages, everyone walking in the steps of those who walked before them. The Red House. A Romano-British farmstead, abandoned, ruined, plundered for stone, built over, burnt and rebuilt. Tenant farmers, underlings of marcher lords, a pregnant daughter hidden in the hills. A man who put a musket in his mouth in front of his wife and sprayed half his head across the kitchen wall. A drunken priest who lost the house in a bet over a horse race, or so they said, though they are long gone. Two brass spoons under the floorboards. A 20,000 mark Reichsbank note. Letters from Florence cross-written to save paper, now brown and frail and crumpled to pack a wall. Brother, my lungs are not good. The sons of the family cut down at Flair Corselet and Morval. Two ageing sisters hanging on through the Second World War. One succumbing to cancer of the liver. The other shipped off to a nursing home in Wilth Wells. Cream paint and stripped pine. The fire blanket in its red holster. The Shentons, 22nd to the 29th of March. We saw a deer in the garden. Framed watercolours of mallow and campion. Biodegradable washing up liquid a random selection of elderly second-hand hardbacks, a pamphlet from a goat farm. <laughs> so you, you have a sense of history, a, a, a landscape that's been patterned by history. And houses as well, actually. Uh, my father was an architect, and um, someone asked me recently what you have to imagine before you get a, a novel written. You know, some might just need to know the characters or what they're wearing or where they are. I need to know the house they're in. Um, as long as I've got a floor plan of the house... I can start to see people moving around in it. I'm also highly aware, and this is particularly appropriate today, 
here, having just been through the house. Houses always seem very sort of dynamic to me. People always leave something behind in the house. Even if you scrape a house clean, the very way that the house is designed tells you a little story about the lives people used to live there and the things they did in that house. Um, and the, it, it actually opens with a, with a train journey across. Yeah. And you have this lovely, um, this lovely image of the train unzipping the land. Train unzipping um, the fields, unzipping yes. Unzipping the fields. So you have a sense of the, 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 the way that people move through something opens, it opens up the reality. Do you know, I wish I could name the name here, but I can't resist telling you the story. <clears throat> A certain writer who will remain nameless, who in a poem a long time ago used a similar influence, wrote me a letter saying, um, quoting that open paragraph, and then said, see my date, the confluence of genius, question mark. <laughs> Come and see me afterwards, OK? <laughs> so let's move on to the inhabitants of the house. Okay. So you've got these two families. Um, one of the things that is, is sort of bubbling under is, is they're all of different social classes. So you've got Richard, who's a, a very the, the brother who, start, who invites the family over, who's a, a hospital consultant, who's mm -hmm. married beneath him, somebody who's yeah. like a bit of a footballer's wife type, as seen by other characters. Yeah. And then you've got... Um, and, and this is something that comes up a lot in your work. I'm slightly fascinated by the... Well, I'm fascinated by two things. One is that's the way we judge people very quickly... And on the one hand, that's terribly facile because people are obviously rich and varied human beings. But, but people present themselves like that as well. Isn't that, that's the language we talk with each other. Um, and you can sort of tell someone's character from a difference as well. But you can also tell the tribe that they have chosen to belong to. Um, yeah, and that fascinates me. And the way, the way people have to move between those classes as well. And I think I've seen it particularly in my own life as well because... Um, my grandparents were all grandparents were very working class. Like my father's grandparents worked in a sort of boot factory and a, the rest assured bed factory as well in Northampton. And then my father was a member of that generation that, don't, that doesn't really get talked about very much. But I think a lot of people have that experience of starting out. Um, what well, he got no real exams at all at school uh, at all. He scored nothing. Then he became quite good at sport and he went back to college and trained to become an architect and became quite well off, and survived the building slump of the 70s by designing abattoirs for Dalgetty Buswell and other meat processors. <laughs> so I was born into quite a sort of well-off middle-class family, and I got sent away to school. So I could go into the houses belonging to um, friends from school who were really well off, and then I'd go back to my grand's house, which had the sort of electroplated nickel silver in the front room and the sort of spare room at top you never went into, um, and Grandad grew carnations out the back with sort of paper bags over them, and they still had to see the air raid shelter in the garden. So I've always felt... Um, I love that mix of those two things. Mm -hmm. I, started, I worry that I'm getting slightly too middle class now. I'm missing the other, the other end of it. Well, what, and I, what you do that I think is really interesting, clever in this, is, is it's all perceived within a... It's all um, modified by other people's consciousness. It's not... It's nothing that you're observing as the author. It's, it's, well, it is, obviously, in that you've written it, but, but the way that characters are perceived, because, particularly because of the particular subjectivity of the way you write, everything is slightly queasy and uncertain, unformed. I've tried to write in a way, and I know this is... Well, one of the stories of my writing life is that... You're right, millions of people brought Curious Incident, and a lot of people who never wrote never read books before at all. A lot of people, it was the only book they've ever read. Or people who read one book a year. And I, I, much as I dislike doing this, subsequently my job has been to sort of shed readers book by book. Um, and I know some people really didn't like this because what I've tried to do is move very rapidly between people's points of view to give you a sense of what it's really like in a family. Um, when we're on our own, we have often quite a solid sense of who we are. But as soon as we go back to our families, when we have, particularly have parents on one side and children on the other, we are different people to all those people. And it's very hard to remember exactly who you are. And even when you're in the same room, you're talking to your mother and then you're talking to your child, you realise that you yourself are a little crowd of different people. And it's often very hard to negotiate all those people that you are. Um, and on top of that, I, I think families have a kind of a character as well. A family is a kind of multi-legged beast all of its own. So I wanted to just let, let all those voices talk. There's no authorial voice. You just you move between, often quite rapidly, within, within one paragraph, between different po people's points of view. It's quite, quite um, 
poignant here, of all places, because this is the house of modernism, in a way, isn't yeah. it? And it is a modernist novel, and in, a, it, in the sense that it's stream of consciousness. It's, well, it's stream of many people's consciousness, so it's a, it's a moderated form of, of modernism. Yeah, and I, I, there's one writer I, I've never fallen out of love with, and that's Virginia Woolf. Um, if you're a writer, you're asked at least once a year to give your, sort of your, your favourite books ever, and, and I find that that list changes all the time. Every time I go back to someone who I enjoyed at some time and reread them, I find that... I think all good books are rather like people, and you, you, know, they, you, ch you change in their absence and they change in your absence as well. And if a book is a really living thing, you can meet up again and find that you've gone your different ways. I mean, it happened with Thomas Pynchon, for example. I used to love Thomas Pynchon. Then I picked something up recently. I thought, I don't, I don't remember who we were. What do we have in common? But Virginia Woolf, I sort of, I, I reread her all the time. And there was something that she does, which I don't think anyone else has ever done as well, which is that sense of what it's like to be inside a human mind and a body moment to moment that weird membrane we have around ourselves. You know, sometimes we feel so alone in a crowded room, and sometimes this whole membrane becomes completely transparent. You feel yourself sort of melting or glowing or just spreading out across the room. I think no one else does it as well but as But what her. you do is slightly different, because you create a social being out of... It's like the stream of consciousness is the stream in the family. It's not in one person. It streams from one person to the other, and the... The sort of um, the, the the soul is in the is in the community, which just strikes me as a really interesting moderation of the idea of one person whose stream of consciousness dominates everything. It's halfway between that. Well, Curious was the very first person novel, wasn't it? Aggressively mm. first person. We're talking about taking onto the stage, which is aggressively third person. But there is a middle ground, which is quite accessible to you as a novelist, which is not accessible anywhere else. That sense of us as social beings, things that we share. I was, I was wondering, there's a little bit of the dinner party somewhere, that quite near the beginning, when they have that, that first meal together, when you have the thoughts just ricocheting between them. Could you find it now and read that? Are you going to talk while I find it, or do you want do you, to uh, I can talk, I can talk. You find <laughs> it, go on, you find it. Sorry, because uh, probably not, not all of you have read this book, and I just think that to actually be able to demonstrate exactly how it works. And what happens is that... At first, it's almost it's sort of slightly queasy making because the the character you you don't know which character you're in or who or why they're talking like they are and they keep all these different perspectives come into a single conversation and then gradually you realise that actually it's it's almost like a a ground sheet a social ground sheet is put out which suddenly all the people pop up from so they're very particular but within the dynamic they're created and held by the dynamic that they're in. Keep Is going, that enough? Claire. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I should. Have, I should. Have, I, I had some yellow post-it sticking out of it. <laughs> you just talk amongst yourselves, okay? You we'll just sort of sit here and. Um, can you talk and and read? No, look, absolutely and look not. At the same time? Oh, maybe maybe we just give it up. No, only I'll... as my wife says, only women can do two things at the same time. Men are impossible. <laughs> but there are lots of lots of people are doing this modernism thing at the moment. There's you. There's Lady Smith. There's Will Self. Why? What, what what is it about this moment that has called for this? And then I can have a little rifle while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, they're they're very different books, aren't they? I mean, I, Umbrella by Will Self is. I found it um, astonishingly brilliant book, but it's quite hard to get into. Um, it was very sort of high density modernism. Um, no, no, let's just talk together. Let's let's just talk together. I won't look. I'll stop looking for it. I'll stop looking for it. Yes. The other thing I thought as I was reading through this as well, it's not just, um, as I was flicking through, it reminded me that it's not just about the voices of different people in a family. I'm also interested in the other voices you find in a house. I mean, the idea for this book partly came from staying with a, with a family of friends in a house in France. And while I was there, I was taking lots of photographs of the house because... You're meant to take photographs of your children and your spouse by the swimming pool, aren't you? And I was taking photographs of the weed killer under the sink and what was in the attic. And I particularly loved the, the, the framed photographs that the family who owned the house had left behind. Um, they left behind, actually, in fact, a, a collage of, of pictures above the toilet in the, down, the downstairs loo. And it was rather fascinating because they'd obviously bought this French farmhouse during the sort of uh, early 80s. And he was a, obviously slightly sort of Hooray Henry City type. You know the striped rugby shirts with the rather clean, big white collars? And she had ra rather sort of Farrah Fawcett Major's hair. And you saw them sort of getting slightly older and paunchier through the photographs <laughs> as, as they put in the swimming pool and did the house up. So on the one hand, it was, 
It was one of the many little narratives you found in the house. There was, here was another story sort of laid out for you, but it was also like a sort of bit of sort of territorial sort of weighing up a lamppost, I felt, because you were in the loo and they were saying, just remember that it's our house, will you? Um, but at the same time, I, I also became obsessed with the kind of books that you find uh, when you rent a cottage somewhere. There's always a sort of... It's like a sort of a library, a sort of a tsunami of library, has sort of swept in and left some, some rubble there and then swept back again. And so a lot of the... There are a lot of passages in this book about books, not in a sort of reverential way, but in the way that you stumble over bits of books. It's, near, it's set in Hay on why, why as well, partly because I know it, partly because I like that way of coming across bits of books, leafing through books. Um, in, people buy books in this. They go into Hay, they take them home, they read them, they fall asleep, um, they get bored with them. Um, I love the fact that at one point, the Dominic is in a, in a bookshop, and he's thinking about the terrible lives that authors live. Dominic lead. is the other so, husband, the, the husband, husband of the sister, who's, who's, it turns out to be a bit of a cad, really. A bit of a cad, he? having a rather failed life. But, and he, he's leafing through these poetry books and um, thinking how difficult it must be for a writer. And he's saying, uh, paid less than bin men, apparently. So little risk and so, so much risk and so little adventure. So there's a bit of home truth there. For a bit you. of home truth there. Well, yes, obviously, <laughs> the risk has been okay for me, but not for most people. Not for most people. But the um, the, the real centre at the heart for me is the, is the young people, the teenagers, and, the, and particularly Benji, who's very, you're very good at writing prepubescent boys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it's funny. Different. What, what what I I'm rather proud of the fact that everyone says to me. The heart of this book is yeah. dot, dot, dot. And then what's nice that people insert a different thing or a different character. Yeah. Um, do you know, I think it's not that I'm necessarily good at writing children. I think it's that children don't appear very often in adult novels. They don't appear in a fully fleshed out form. Um, and until recently, they were almost completely absent. I'm often, I find I'm a little sort of lone voice of protest when people say that Revolutionary Row by Richard Yates is a masterpiece, for example, and I have to point out that there are two children involved in this tragic story who would have played very important roles, who are ciphers in the book. And I think I sometimes score points for just putting children in there. I mean, I'd like to think I'm good at doing them as well, but I think it's just because they're missing a lot of the time. But one of the things, the, the way you inhabit the mind of a small boy who's actually asking more intelligent questions than anyone else... But that's just normal small boys, isn't it? They don't, well, there, there, are lot, there, are other, there are other good reasons, I think, for having children in a novel. I mean, I like writing about them. They're part of life, and I feel it's almost a sort of... It, morally, you have to, if you're going to write about families, you have to write children as well. But they're blessed with certain characters, which are a great gift for a novelist. One, they ask utterly shameless questions. I mean, I, we have two small boys, and they will just ask the most brutally frank questions. Um, which are really interesting, because they're often questions you've never asked. And when they get a bit older, um, particularly there's, there's three teenagers here. There's uh, Melissa. Melissa is the doctor's daughter, and she is... She's a bitch, to be honest. She's the kind of extremely beautiful teenage girl who, when she shakes her hair, everything goes into slow motion, and these great <laughs> auburn locks just swing behind her. And then there's Daisy, who's very sort of drab, and she's having worries about her sexuality. She's joined an alpha core. She's deeply, deeply confused. And, and then there's Alex, who is a rather straightforward sort of guy who just thinks about sport and sex. <laughs> what I like about them is that they are... They have the same obsessions that everyone else has. So that when you get to a certain age, all your levers and knobs start to be turned down, and all the intensity on all our feelings sort of goes down. But when you're, when you're 15, 16, 17, you're feeling all those adult things for the first time, and you haven't yet learned how to control them. And there is something... Those, those same emotions are there, but at a higher temperature. Mm. And they're on the surface. You don't have to dig around so much to get them out. Mm. Can I also just say about Melissa? Mm. Having called even a fictional woman, having called even a fictional woman a bitch on stage, I think I ought to qualify that. <laughs> I really like being able to write about someone who would be hated by almost everyone they met. <laughs> For the reason that I think... I think if you make, in, in real life and on paper, if you make an effort to understand even the most unpleasant people, 
you can get to a place inside them when you, where you realise that they are exactly the same of, as you, but they have taken some bad decisions about how to negotiate their relationship with the world around them. And I felt... I don't, know any, I don't know any women, any girls in my life who are like that, so she's very alien. But I felt there was a moment when I thought, I can imagine being someone like that, being, being 16 and being very beautiful and knowing that sort of I was incredibly attractive but, and I could manipulate people, but I didn't know how to make people genuinely like me. And I thought, it was, it was a moment of it clicking, and I think, yeah, I kind of I understand that now. And then I felt sort of at home inside her. She's done something really terrible, but at, off stage. Yes. That we, so we don't actually see. And one of the things about this novel that is quite an interesting dis decision of yours is that nothing really happens in it very much, apart from... <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's so dramatic, but actually they go through a weekend and there is a minor injury, but very quite minor. And it's so clever the way you, you hold the drama of everything that happens extrinsically to what's but, actually happening but in the house. But people suffer, suffer greatly. Yes, uh, and, and but in I plotting think, terms. In plotting terms, yeah, they're just, they're just stuck in this one place. Um, I think one of the problems in a, in a novel, if you have too much happening, if you, have, if you have car chases and you have people jumping out of planes, it, doesn't, it gives you an excuse for not slowing down and looking at the tiny things. I'm, I forced myself to write about a week in which very little happened so that people were turned in on themselves. I mean, one of the subjects of the novel is the fact that a lot of people don't like going on holiday because they don't like the company of their own mind, the company of their own heart. And in fact, several people say that explicitly in the novel. But for me, that was really interesting, to force people to spend some time in their own company. And I think for a lot of people, that is a, a really difficult thing to do. Mm. Yes, I can imagine it would be quite difficult to, for you to spend time on your own. Is that true? Oh, God, I spend all my time on my own. That's why writers are so com completely insane. We all need to go out and do a proper job. <laughs> well, except... Actually, that, is, that, is a, that, that is quite serious. That is a reason why so many writers are completely insane. I think if you're the kind of person who... Um, a kind of person who's in mental health is so um, taken for granted that you just want to go off and climb mountains or fly planes or, and everything is self-evident to you. You're not the kind of person who's interested in writing in the first place because the interior, the interior of your head is not a, an interesting place. But if you are one of those people for whom existing moment by moment is not self-evident and easy and you do become a writer, you're, you're then placed in the position... Of, of spending all day at home on your own, um, which is possibly the worst state to be in if you're that kind of sort of introverted person. I often I say, to, we talk about this writer's friends, and we say, with the exception that if you're a writer, you might earn quite a lot of money, in every other respect, it's like being long-term unemployed with probably the same sort of medical downsides. But you also do other things. You fill time with other things, don't you, apart I do, from I have to, yeah. Painting, for example. I paint, too. Um, because I can't write all the time. Um, Simon Stevens is the, the rather wonderful playwright who adapted Curious for the Stage. And we were talking about this recently. And he shocked me because I said, so Simon, how many of the projects you start do you give up on? I mean, how many plays do you start not finish? And he, he looked at me in a rather puzzled way and said, I've never given up on anything. He writes two or three plays every year. He knows what they're going to be. He starts them and he finishes them on time. <laughs> It's unbelievable. I'm sure there are many. I'm, I'm sure there are novelists who do something very similar, but I and I, I dearly, dearly wish it was the case. I find it very, very difficult. Um, I mean, before writing this, I wrote, I wrote almost an entire novel and threw the whole thing away. And I wish I had a kind of time machine which would tell me which projects are not going to work. And then I could sort of jump backwards and just sort of sidestep them to start with. But you did say something really interesting once in one of our sessions mm -hmm. about... <laughs> <laughs> about you put uh, me in my place, didn't you? <laughs> about about with the five novels that you wrote before the, the, um, the Curious Incident. And you said you felt that by the time you wrote The Curious Incident, you'd spent a lot of time under the bonnet of a car, so you knew how the engine worked. I thought that was a really brilliant line, and I quote it a lot to people. <laughs> Do you credit me? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry, yeah. No, I, I, I credit Wittgenstein, actually. <laughs> um, 
I hate... I, it was really, really hard work writing five novels, wanting them to get published, and then not being angry that they weren't published. Worse than that, realising they just weren't very good and having to throw them away. That's a very, very painful process. But when I finally wrote something that worked, I realised that it was a kind of blessing because we all know people who were gifted with a kind of voice very early on and wrote a novel that was published and was successful and was lauded. And that seemed initially um, a rather wonderful state for them to be in. But of course, what they then lost is the ability to learn and make, make mistakes in private. And I think, I think there are writers who've really suffered on that account. Um, so I get a, I have a feeling it, it doesn't necessarily help me write any better, but I know how, I know how writing works and fails because I've, I've watched it fail so often on my desk. And I think that's useful. Mm. And that, just going back, I'm going to open it up to questions in a minute, So do, but I'm going to ask one more question to give you a chance to think of what you want to ask. Um, and that's the question of the stillborn child in this yeah. book, which seems very profound to me. There, there is the, they are, um, Angela is mourning still a stillborn child who would have been 18, and she calls her her little monster because she was born with a genetic abnormality. And she is this sort of really sort of in some way literally haunting figure to... Well, she appears at one point as a ghost, doesn't she? Um, when we say there's nothing much happening in terms of plot, and I say that forces you back in on yourself, there are things in our lives which are hugely important. They're not dramatic in the sense of things that happen. They're often things that didn't happen. They're kind of yearnings and sadnesses and lacks. Um, so I say this, it's a, it, it's a book about eight members of an extended family. It's really about nine members of an extended family because as important as the other is this, is this girl who never came into the world. But because her mother has never, never accepted that, she has, she has three children and she has this ghost child as well who's sort of running in parallel with the other children. And she's like a sort of black hole and you can't see her but her gravity has thrown everything else um, out of shape. And we have to mention the nine-piece puzzle in this Do we have to do this? We have to, okay, mention, we have to do one. the nine-piece puzzle. But, but partly because actually I've had another thought about the nine-piece puzzle. Uh, tell them about okay. the nine-piece puzzle. <laughs> Claire was interviewing me at the Edinburgh Book Festival uh, last year, and she said, as I was reading this book, I kept thinking of those little plastic tile puzzles you used to get in party bags about 1970. Remember, they were like a flat plastic grid, and they had eight slidable tiles and a missing square, and you could... A rearrange the picture by virtue of there being a missing square. And I went, shit, because the novel I'd been working on and given up on before The Red House was called The Missing Square. It had eight chapters. Each was going to be... It was grotesquely misconceived, the whole thing. Um, each chapter was going to be a different genre. There was going to be um, a, a narrative poem, a graphic novella, a short story, an essay, a script of a zombie movie. Um, <laughs> The central image was one of those tile puzzles, and the central conceit was that um, the world contains certain absences or spaces or holes which seem to make the world imperfect, but whose absence gives the freedom for everything else to move around, for meaning to be newly created. And um, the theme which linked all the chapters together was that of missing, dead, or absent children. Um, I, I'm slightly ashamed to admit this now, but I was even toying with the idea of having a ninth chapter made of blank pages. <laughs> and of course, it wasn't until we were talking about this on stage, because that was extraordinary enough, and only as we were talking about it did I, say, did I realize that The Red House is a novel about eight characters and one ninth character who is missing and who has this huge effect on all the other characters. But now I wonder... How Actually, I'm getting the hair on the back of my neck. Yes, yeah, so I feel, I, feel, I, I, it's, it's, I feel quite haunted by this as well because I wonder how much that's about you as a writer and that there's this missing character, you know, that that's the novels that haven't been born or the... It just seems it's quite a profound thing and the fact that you hadn't really articulated it to yourself before it came up in that context... That would be quite a noble way of looking at it, wouldn't it? I think, <laughs> I think actually it's... Um, I keep trying to write something different and I realise that I'm sort of often writing the same things. And that's both, both depressing, but, it, but it's all right. You know, I, 
I set out thinking I have this whole country to explore, and I can go off in any direction, and I realise that my mind is rather like, rather like one of those treasure maps your children draw and stick on the fridge. <laughs> And, you know, you have the sort of the palm trees and the treasure and the sort of quicksand and everything else. And I think I'm going on this long journey, but in fact, I'm just going around this sort of same island and, and things crop up again and again. So I'm always talking about disability. Uh, evangelical Christianity comes up a lot. Um, balconies and tower blocks come up all the time. Um, I kill animals all the time. Um, <laughs> I killed a dog. Uh, there's a short story. In a, I wrote a short story last year called The Gun, in which a deer was killed. Another short story in the island in which a seagull and a seal were killed. Um, there's a shrew killed in this. I wrote, in fact, I wrote a short story um, a few months ago um, called The Pier Falls. It's about a pier collapsing. And 76 people are killed. <laughs> One dog survives. <laughs> I, I finished it and I felt I'd sort of attempted to restore some kind of psychic balance. <laughs> yes, because you, you can get into terrible trouble for killing animals, can't you, in, in books. I know Dan Rhodes for Timely and Vita comes home. He always, he always gets um, booed in, in hay, at hay. I've seen him booed several times. For, Which animal? Did he for, kill a dog? He killed a dog. Yeah, and people are absolutely outraged. But I'm a famous dog killer. Why uh, am I not booed? And, well, maybe it's because, because nobody could blame Christopher somehow. Oh, it's I see. mediated yes. through the mind of Christopher. Do you know of all the things, that all, all the reasons people have complained about Curious Incident, quite often in America, actually, quite often during One City, One Reads um, uh, events where everyone in a city gets to read a book, they've complained about many things, mostly the swearing and the atheism. But no one's... Com complained about the dead about dog yet. The dog. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's open it out to the audience now. There, we, there are a couple of roving mics, I think. Um, we got anybody who's going to ask their first question? It's always hard to ask the first question. No questions. I'll ask myself no a question curious. if you're being particularly lazy. <laughs> yes, go on. Uh, let me, I, I will say something. We've, I've been thinking about this today, particularly with reference to um, the house here and the middle-classness of this book. And something that someone said to me about Curious Incident recently, which I'd never, I'd never really thought about before. I do feel, I write about middle class families in this because that's my milieu, that's the, that's the, the life I live and I, I, they're my friends so I know what they have in their bathrooms and what they eat for supper. So if you're gonna write that kind of dense, realistic narrative, that's what I latch on to. But I get a feeling at the moment that middle class novels don't have a lot of traction. You know what I mean? I don't feel they're saying quite as much about the world as they could do. Whereas novels that come from the margins, in one way or another, seem to have much more traction. And someone pointed out to me, and they said, they talk, said, when you're writing Curious, were you, were you uh, wary about writing about this lower middle class family? whose dad's a plumber and heating engineer, and they live in Swindon. And I said, I never really thought about that. And it suddenly occurred to me that some of the traction I think Curious Incident has has in fact got nothing to do with the disability at all. Mm. It's to do with the fact that it's a family which is not a sort of middle class book reading family of a kind that you don't normally see in novels. Mm. And somehow the whole um, disability subject matter has somehow blinded me mm. to that. Well, for example, Christopher's father is an, has to go out at night to fix people's leaks. Because yeah. if you're a plumber, you have to go yeah, out and do yeah. it, don't you? Which um, puts a, a certain pressure on, on his relationship with Christopher. And it's funny because as a, a, as a writer, I think we're all very similar from whatever background we come from. The, the, the psychology of how we relate to each other is, is very similar. If you have a stillborn daughter, you know, your social class is probably not a huge factor in that. It's a very common experience, you know, around the globe, isn't it? But there's something about the character you give it to gives it a kind of purchase on the reader's mind. And I get the feeling there are different parts of society which, it, it, it's like fields which, 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 which produce lots of crops and then have to lie fallow. I mean, I think the field which has to lie fallowest at the moment is like public school, for example. And there was a period in English history where there were lots of public school novels, novels about those kind of people, and they were fine. They seemed to have traction. And even when you go back to read Bride Said Now, it feels as if it's got traction. But you couldn't write about those people at the moment and have quite the same traction, could you? Oh, that's an interesting one. I bet, I bet people will have lots of examples. In fact, there's somebody at the back. Oh, there, oh look, we've got three now. Oh, I don't know if I do. But anyway. um, Mark, I was just, I've just been 
thinking about your um, comment about children often being left out of, um, of adults' novels. Yeah. And I, wonder, I, I personally think that Virginia Woolf's portrayal of James into the lighthouse is the most amazingly poignant reaction of the sort of silent fury of the boy as he's thwarted in his passion to go and visit the lighthouse by his father, Mr. Ramsay, and also Charles Tansley, who sort of stands there and gloats. And I just wondered what you thought about her, you know, whether that was a character that you felt was... Oh, she's so good at children in that book. I think it's James who, who, who's sort of half in love with his father and then James just killing him with a poker, doesn't he? Just hitting with that sort of poker. She's great about that, um, how you can love and hate parents as well. And it's particularly poignant because Mr. Ramsey doesn't quite know how to relate to children either, does he? And a bit of him would like, like to be a father, but he's this, he's this lumbering, old-fashioned Edwardian academic dinosaur. Um, and Mrs. Ramsey feels the same way as well. You know, this yearning for tenderness and this impossibility for it as well. But yeah, you're right. She does two children absolutely brilliantly. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Afterwards, there's a microphone over there. Oh, sorry. I can, yes. Uh, where are we going? We're going to one here and then oh. one over there. Actually, it's um. not a very profound question, oh. but it was when you were talking earlier. Hello. Yes. yes. You can hear me now? Um, when you were talking, I was, about, I was going to ask you, before you came in, why you hadn't written another play. Because I saw your Polar Bears and loved the way we started and a little about what you were talking about. We suddenly got the story of what was going on. But you've just mentioned you've written another play. No, I've written, I've written uh, one play, Polar Bears. It was the Donmar Warehouse. That's the one I saw, yeah. yes. Um, but, oh, then, if you haven't... Well, I'm trying to write one at this very moment. You are, moment. that's what you said. So, yeah. is that difficult? It's bloody impossible. <laughs> I shall talk, just talk about this, the, the, the yeah. difference in the experiences. Um, not, I, I enjoy, really enjoyed writing the play, but almost as, as importantly, I enjoyed, enjoyed being with people who make theatre. Um, it's very lonely writing a novel. It's, it's really good to be out of the house and just working with other people. It, it's... It's doubly good to be working with theatre people, um, particularly in the subsidised theatre. I think it's different in the West End. Having worked in TV and film, which, I, which I'll never do again, it's great to be in, in, in a team of people, all of whom have exactly the same end in mind, which is to make a good, as good an experience as they can for the audience watching that play. Um, there's no better editing that you will get than watching a team of highly trained professionals try and act something that you haven't written quite well enough. You know, when you write a novel, you can sort of pretend that people will skip that page. No one will skip the page in the play that you're, that you're, you're writing. There is also something profoundly moving to me in a way I've never yet been quite able to articulate about watching really good actors work, particularly in a rehearsal room. Fundamentally, they are doing the silliest thing imaginable. They are dressing up and pretending to be someone else, which is what we all like to do when we were six. But they do it with the kind of conviction and intensity of surgeons or airline pilots. Because if you get it wrong, you get it wrong every night in front of 300 people. And that combination of the fundamental silliness and the absolute conviction and seriousness says something to me about the way of leading a human life, which I find enormously uplifting. But it's also play, isn't it? Yeah, but it's but really very serious, serious play. play. The other thing I was going to say, the other thing I like about theatre, and this goes back to novel writing, I like the fact that theatre people look after each other. It's suddenly, the only reason is it started to strike me as extraordinary that um, novelists are asked to review each other's novels. Um, no one in their right mind would ask a playwright to go and review someone else's play, which is because it would be seen as, you know, poacher versus poacher, which is why, and I don't know whether you agree with this, I mean, I, I, I have lots of really good writers' friends, but if I'm in a group of theatre people, the atmosphere is just slightly warmer than in a group of bookish people, where there are several people in the room you know need to be kept apart. <laughs> And I, and I like that, I like that sense of community, because it's a bit stronger in theatre than mm. it is in books. I'd say def that's definitely true. I couldn't believe how sort of egocentric write 
novel novelists were, particularly after having met lots of theatre people. And everybody always says it's the actors. I know. It isn't the actors. Actors are the most maligned group of people. OK, yeah, the, of course, there are more maligned people in the world, but <laughs> actors are badly maligned. Next question. Uh, you talked about um, junking novels uh, that you weren't happy with. How do you judge your own writing without getting feedback from a reader, so to speak? Did you know when you finished Curious Incident that it was a good book? Or how do you judge that before you've got a I, readership? I did know it was a good book, actually. Uh, by which I meant I thought someone would publish it and we'd sell at least a few thousand copies. It's, it, it's, something, it's something just there, there, actually. It's a very corporeal thing. And it doesn't happen very often because I'm not a terribly good... I'm not a very good writer, but I know that I'm a quite a good rewriter. And I will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite until something works. And when it does work, there's a sort of... a sense of something almost physically clicking into place. And I can go back to that same bit of writing again and again and thinking, yeah, that's nice and solid. It's like a table. It's like you've got all the legs exactly the same length. And you, if you push it, it doesn't move. Um, it doesn't happen very often. But the, I have one really good reader, who's my, my, my wife, who's a brilliant reader. She's, she'll be ruder to me than anyone else will as well, which is also very uh, useful. I mean, there are lots of writers out there who've lost the ability to find people who will be rude to them. Luckily, my, my wife will still be really rude to me. She's very perceptive. Um, because I somehow internalised her voice, and we, we're very close, and sometimes she'll be sitting on the sofa and she'll say, oh, give me that thing to read, and I will, I will literally I'll just put it down on her lap. And just the fact that it's in her presence somehow generates this kind of um, divine highlighter pen which lands on the page... <laughs> And as, as I put it down, certain lines are, are suddenly underlined. And I just say, thank you, and I'll pick it up again. And I will just know what's wrong. When I'm teaching creative writing, people often say, who should I give it to read and what should I look for in a reader? And I will say, you need to find the person who says the things that are already being said by that little voice in your head that you are trying to suppress. <laughs> and it, Anyone who stands any chance of being a writer has that voice. And maybe you can't hear it yet. But you, so you have to foster that voice, that self-critical voice, and then find someone else who will encourage you to listen to it. Just talk a little bit about how many times you rewrite, because it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? You... I don't finish a book and then rewrite, but I, I think I described it... Maybe I was talking to you last time. I described it as rather like... At combing a, a long, shaggy-haired dog. I'll sit down every morning and I'll go back to what I've written before and I'll go through it again and again and extend it a bit every day. So that when I'd written... Well, when I, this, for example, I mean, the, the early chapters, would have, I'd have gone through them 60, 70, 80 times. Yeah. But n not change... Sometimes I'll take out a whole paragraph, but I'll, I'll change a few things every single time. Um, yeah, so it is a, it's a process of combing. It means that often means that, that when Curious was published, for example, I got so excited about having finished a novel and thought, yeah, this is actually quite good for once in my life. And um, it got bought. And then I had to, before it was published, published, I had to spend a lot of time pushing this, putting the same effort into the end that I put into the beginning, because the beginning had been written 70, 80, 90 times. And the end had just, you know, 5, 10, 15. So in fact, we had, we had to go in and rewrite the end, because it wasn't, didn't work quite as well as the beginning. And the, 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 is it the, the theatre end is quite different, isn't it? It's, I, I, I thought that the ending, you managed the ending better than the theatre did, actually, if I'm honest. Well, Simon, uh, if you remember at the end of the book, there's... Funny enough, lots of readers say it's not an ambiguous ending to the book. It was very deliberately an, end, an ambiguous ending to the book. Um, Ah, which end do you mean? So this is uh, like yes, exactly. There is there are two there are two yeah. there are two endings to the book and in the theatre as well. The book ends, the the narrative ends, and Christopher says, "Now I can do anything," which strikes me as obviously ambiguous because he's been wrong about so many things. Although lots of readers say how uplifting that is, and I think mm, yes, that's very lovely. Um, <laughs> but so Simon, who's uh, written the play, has ended with him, Simon, Christopher saying, "I can do anything, Siobhan, can't I? I can do anything, can I?" And it's her oh. face that tells the story, the real story. Uh, maybe she was having a cheery night that night. No, she was having a very sad night. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then we wait, and then, then there's a cut, and it's blackout. So you're waiting for the answer, and you don't get it. So I, Simon was 
very deliberately making sure that you understood that it was ambiguous. And I, I was very glad about that. Um, any but more I'll, questions? Have a, I'll have a word. You can have a word. Neve Cusack. Have a word. Yeah, she was practically in tears. And I, thought, I thought it was incredibly sad. And then I thought, well, they had to then bring in a very cheerful solving of the, uh, of the problem. Well, of course, that's the other thing. In, I was, in, in, in the play, in the book, if you remember, um, there's an appendix at the end in which Christopher shows you how he solved his A-level maths problems. If you see it at the theatre, don't leave after the last curtain no. call because um, a few minutes later, uh, Christopher comes back on and tells you how he solved his uh, A-level maths problem. And it's just the most joyous piece of theatre. I love it. <laughs> oh, we've got one there. One, one right over in the corner. This is on, actually. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that you said just briefly, Mark, where you said um, you loved actors and working in the theatre was wonderful. And then you just said, oh, but not TV and film. Well, why not and what was the difference? OK, TV and film. Um, I've written several things for kids' TV and I wrote a single film for, for TV. <clears throat> in essence, the problem is there is too much money and too many people involved whose job is the business, not the art that's coming out of it. I sometimes say it's like, it's like, it's like being a little barnacle of art trying to steer an oil tanker of commerce. Um, OK, quick story about the film I did. for This illustrates it perfectly. I wrote a film called Coming Down the Mountain for, for the BBC in Tiger Aspect. It was about two brothers, one of whom has Down syndrome. Actually, what I'm really, really proud about, about that film is we gave a, a lead role to Tommy Jessup, who has Down syndrome. Almost the only ever time that a lead speaking role for someone with Down syndrome has been on television. So I'm really glad about that. But it was about his brother, who becomes jealous and who tries to kill him. It was commissioned by the BBC. <clears throat> it was filmed. It had Nick Holt playing the other brother. Um, it was filmed... Uh, the whole visual edit was locked. The only thing that was left to do was for actors to go in and do a few overdubs, you know, when you cut away in scenes. And uh, Jane Tranter, who was in charge of BBC Drama at that time, who had commissioned it originally, looked at it and said, um, could you recut it to show it before the watershed, please? Because she got a sort of gap before the watershed. Everyone involved just said, fuck off, we're going home. The actors went home, the director went home. I said, I'm not doing any publicity because, you know, she asked for one thing, and then she said, oh, can you just turn it into something else I wanted now, please? Um, there was lots of, obviously, if you murder someone and they're swearing, it's got to be post-watershed. Um, I suddenly understand the real skill of being an executive TV producer, because um, Greg... God, should I tell this here? I'll be in such trouble, won't I? <laughs> um, OK, the, the, one of the executives involved did something rather brilliant, which was that he went to see the woman who does compliance for the BBC. The woman who does compliance sits at home with, with a huge... Um, book like that, which basically tells you how many times you can say arse after eight o'clock, <laughs> and um, how much of a nipple you can show before five, that kind of thing. So she looked through the whole thing, and she said, well, I'd love it as a film, I think you should, it'd be butchery to take anything out of it, but I'll give you the figures, I'd go through, she said, you'll have to take out about 18 to 20 percent of the whole thing, because there are kids smoking and drinking, um, swearing. And then what he did, which was rather brilliant, instead of um, going to Jane Tranter and saying, look, this is what'll happen, he gave the information to someone junior in her office. And this person in her office sort of went up to him and said, I, I worked something out. I think it'd be a bad idea to, to suggest this, because this is what would happen. So Jane Tranter came along and said, look, we've had a think about this in the office. <laughs> and we reckon it's probably not a good idea. So we will show it after the watershed, after all. But, you know, we were, that, we were that close to the whole thing being hold below the waterline because the person who commissioned it decided at the last minute she wanted to use it for plugging a hole she got somewhere else. And that happens all the time in film and TV because it's, it's about the money and the art is just this offshoot. Mm. We've got time for one more. One more question. Yes? Have we got someone with a mic already? Or is it? Yeah, just there. Um, actually, it's two, two very quick questions. Um, one is, um, as somebody who's just had uh, one of my grandchildren diagnosed with Asperger's, um, like so many people, probably and even in this room, um, I just wondered if you took any credit, which I think you should do, for raising awareness of, um, aut of the autistic spectrum and helping people to understand it. Um, no, I don't take any credit whatsoever. I mean, looking at it objectively, yes, I know that book 
created a lot of, of talk about it and I get letters from people who said it's been really useful in their families and I think that's sort of undeniable. But then I like to sort of put another hat on and say that book is about difference. It's about being an outsider. It's about being excluded by other people. It's about having another view of the world and it's about it's about the fact that labels tell us what we think about the person who we're labelling, and they tell us absolutely nothing about the person. And I love the fact that Christopher labels himself in the novel, and, and Asperger's isn't used at all. So, yeah, I wear two completely different hats. So I, fi I, fight, I, I fight the novel's corner as a novel, and um, I'm trying to stick up for unlabeled difference, but I, I, you know, I get letters saying the opposite as well. And the other um, question is, you've mentioned that you wrote five books before um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the dog, and, um, and you also mentioned a proper job uh, in, in, at some stage in, in your talking. And, um, <clears throat> and I just wondered if you had taken the risk of writing those five books without working at the same time, or if you'd had held a job down and been writing before you you know, you had this great success. Okay, the truth is I've never held on a proper job in my life for more than three months. Not because I wanted to become a writer, because I think I'm actually constitutionally incapable of turning up at the same place every day and being told what to do. I think the longest I ever held down a job was as a, on a sort of phone sales team for a, a cycle parts mail order company in Edgware, and I was there for two and a half months, and I couldn't bear it any longer, and I actually rang up and said that I'd had a cycle accident and broken my leg and I wouldn't be coming in. <laughs> And I think, and it, well, in, I joke about it, but I think what was, writing is really hard, and you need some kind of, um, something to really push you into it. And on the one hand, you need the positive thing, a kind of compulsion or a vocation, but you also, that's the carrot. But I think the stick, in my case, is finding it really, really hard to do any other kind of job. But I was also blessed in that I could write for children, and I also worked as an illustrator as well. When I left um, college, the first, the first paid jobs I did were doing illustrations to people like Private Eye and the CND magazine and the Economist magazine. And it was, it was like the equivalent of that nighttime security guard job that people get when they want to write a novel. Um, because illustration meant sitting around for seven hours a day, and then a magazine would ring up and say, we, we desperately need a cartoon of Bertrand Russell doing in the next two hours, and a bike would turn up with some photographs, and you'd work really hard and then send it off again. And that was perfect, because in those gaps, I was, I was able to write. And he is still a very good artist. Uh, uh, you're doing portraits a lot now, aren't you? I'm, 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 I'm doing portraits of writers, actually. When I'm not, when I'm not writing, I'm, oft, I'm often drawing or painting. I'm doing okay. Simon Armitage at this moment. Simon Armitage? Yes. He, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I've been taking, I don't, don't paint from life. I, I, I paint too slowly to paint from life. And, and unless I'm, a, you know, an internationally recognised artist, I can't persuade someone to sit still, for, you know, for three months in front of me. So I will go, I'll go and take four or five hundred photographs of someone and just to get the face where someone relaxes into that, into that, into that expression they'd have if they were sitting for a long period. And with some people, it's really, really hard. If you're taking photographs of Jackie Kay, for example, she's just, she's just electrified all the time. She's always talking about Simon Armitage. I took, I did a, I'm doing a full-size picture of him, which is about, about this. It's almost life-size. Um, so I was taking photographs of the rest of him. And then I got to his face, and I took about four photographs of his face. And I said, Simon, you only have one expression. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's like photographing a lizard. His face doesn't change at all. <laughs> It was brilliant, brilliant. I didn't need to just, I only took three photos of his face. And he said, he said, ah, it's just because I'm a grumpy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and so at that, I think we'll have to stop. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for coming. And he will Thank sign. You. Thank Well, well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Claire, for an absolutely wonderful, illuminating evening full of insights, um, full of wit, full of compassion. I can't imagine the situation where you, where you once only ever managed to say one interesting thing to one another. Um, but I, I, I hope that um, Charleston has been inspiring. And also I'd like to say right now that we will welcome you back um, to launch uh, The Missing Square as soon as it's published. <laughs> um, right, now I'd like to... Uh, w uh,
ask you to remain seated, if you don't mind, just for an extra minute while we take Mark and Claire um, off the stage. And Mark will be willing to uh, sign some books. And I, I do want to say about the Red House that it's not for nothing um, that Virginia Woolf is one of uh, Mark's favourite authors. So if you haven't already got, a, 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 have a, if you don't haven't already read the Red House, now's your opportunity um, to get it. And once more, thank you both very, very much. Thank you.